in um, hearing what we work on as researchers, as graduate students. So um, by way of introduction to that, I want to talk a little bit about the lab that I work in. I work for a wonderful lady named uh, Judy Lieberman, who's a great scientist. And um, we study a lot of different things in the lab. I'll talk about some of those today. Um, but one of the big focuses is how immune cells can actually attack and kill other cells, which is an amazing uh, natural phenomenon. And this is the whole lab here. You see the person standing awkwardly off on stage right is, is me. Um, and this is the whole lab together, and several individuals have contributed a lot to my research, and I'll talk about them at the end. But uh, another question that I encounter a lot when I meet people and I talk about my research is, is something like this. How does, how does one study this stuff? How do you, how do you know this? And um, because we talk about a lot of very abstract things, tiny little molecules and cells. And, and so the other thing that I hope to convey tonight is to give you some idea of how we would study some of the processes that, that happen in cells. So I just said the word cells. Let's begin with the discussion of, of what a cell is. A cell is really a fundamental unit of life. And when I say that, I mean you can't take anything living that we know and, and break its cells apart and still have a thing that is living. And uh, all of us are composed of many, many cells. So we're talking about tens of trillions of tiny cells that constitute the human body. And just to give you a sense of scale, how small these are, the average human cell is maybe about 10 microns in size, which doesn't mean much even to me. So just for frame of reference, we could fit tens of thousands of those on the head of the average size pin. So uh, your average cell is very, very small in a human being. And just a question for all of you. Does anybody know how we first discovered cells? How we, society, first discovered cells? Exactly. So uh, the, the gentleman up front said that uh, Hook uh, basically looked at wood under a microscope. And he saw these little um, boxes in, in what was cork. And uh, he named them cells because they looked like jail cells. And um, one of the key points that I want to convey tonight is that the microscope, which is a very old technology, is such an incredibly powerful technology to study the function of cells. And again and again, we're going to revisit the microscope and how we use it in uh, modern science to investigate cell function. And so I'll show you this picture again later, and we'll talk about what all the things are in it. But another technique that I want to mention briefly is that now we can also use fluorescent molecules. We can link those fluorescent molecules to different pieces of the cell. And those fluorescent molecules allow us to visualize components of the cell that would appear transparent under a microscope. So the way this works is we can shoot a certain wavelength of light at those fluorescent molecules that are bound to specific cell components. They excite in a different wavelength and you can visualize that on the microscope. This is an incredibly powerful technique that I've used in my research, and I'll show you a lot of cool images and kind of hopefully some videos of this happening in cells later. But this idea of a cell is sort of an abstract concept. We know that it's very tiny. So I'm going to introduce just, there's going to be one major analogy in this talk. And uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the great city of Baltimore, Maryland, but I uh, trained there for a couple of years I'm very fond of that city, and it's famous for its row houses. And row houses are you know, these structures that are so close together that they actually will share structural walls. They share outer walls. And, and as such, you can imagine that the integrity of each individual row house is dependent upon its neighbors. And if there were a problem that were to develop in one of the row houses, let's say that it you know, got old and decrepit and potentially condemned, as um, some row houses in Baltimore are, then you can imagine this could threaten the structures of its neighbors. And if we look at a cell, now just keep in mind that this is a magnified image of a cell that's been stained. And this is trillions of times smaller than a house. But <laughs> it's an important point. I'm showing it at the same size, but, but the trillions of size of the time are smaller than a house. But, but it, it shares that they have walls in common. They form these complex structures, and they rely upon each other for support and for nutrients and other things. And, and so I'm going to just have you imagine that cells are in a, a tissue, as we can see here, form tissues such as skin. And tissues together constitute some sort of organ, which makes then, a, let's say, a living, breathing, functioning human being. 
In the same way, we have individual houses in, in Baltimore that together form a block of row houses, which then together form a neighborhood. And, and when you combine all those neighborhoods, you have a bustling metropolis. And my point here is to, to make a simple point that with something very small, like a cell that doesn't look much like a human being, when we put a lot of them together, we can build a human being, something very complex, have something very simple. And this is a theme that we're going to come to again. So we talked about cells. Now, why should you care about cell death? What is this cell death that I'm talking about? Well, the type of cell death that I will be discussing tonight is a clean way for a cell to be removed from your body. And in general, when I'm talking about cell death tonight, I'm talking about cell death in animals such as human beings. And this is sort of the prevailing dogma in the field. And another great thing about this type of cell death is that your immune system can, can recognize this type of cell death and clear away and recycle the components of the cell that are left behind after it dies. Yes? Is this cell death is it similar to other organisms as dogs, cats, and cats? So the question was, is this similar in other organisms such as dogs and cats? And, and it is similar across basically all complex animals. So we can see this type of cell death even in things like worms. Um, their plants have a, a sort of distinct type of cell death. So in general, I would like you to think of organisms that, that are capable of forming tissues, you know, complex structures. Cell death is more important for them. And we'll, we'll talk about why that will be in a minute. But basically, it's just to maintain the health of the organism as a whole. And just to give you a sense of the alternative, this, the type of cell death that I'm talking about is, is very clean. And there's this alternative as gangrene. And gangrene is just a lot of necrotic cells together. Trust me, this is the nicest picture of gangrene. <laughs> um, so gangrene is, is basically a large mass of cells that have broken down in a way that isn't controlled, that isn't clean. Cells have lost their ability to function, but they didn't have time to go through this program that I'm talking about. And you may know just from, you know, from TV or from exposure to medicine that gangrene Tissue that has gangrene just has to be cut away. It won't ever heal. It won't come back. And that's not true of apoptosis, if we have, which is what I'm talking about now. Uh, if we have enough cells that, that die by necrosis, we will never recover. Um, another point that I want to mention is that this type of cell death can be very important for controlling infections. This is a bacteria that actually lives in your cells. And uh, this type of cell death will kill bacteria inside of cells. This is a focus of the lab that I won't talk about more tonight. Um, and also, this is, a, this is a picture of a, a melanoma lesion on a patient who's developed a type of skin cancer called melanoma. And we now know that the type of cell death that I will be talking about tonight is very important for controlling and preventing the development of cancer. And that's another reason that it's so interesting to researchers who study this. So what is this thing that I'm talking about? We call it apoptosis. Um, others will say Apoptosis. This is probably the correct pronunciation. I'm, uh, you know, a little bit less advanced, so I, I still say apoptosis. But suffice to say, this is an incredibly common process in the human body, and probably there are billions to tens of billions of cells dying per day by this program cell death called apoptosis in our bodies. And this is an incredibly important part of maintaining our health. And it sounds sort of morbid or scary, and this is actually our lab t-shirt from last year. I mean, you know, it, it sounds like the name of this like funny, you know, metal band or something, but but it actually is something that we think is really important. And I, I will impress that upon you, hopefully throughout the talk. But the last point that I want to make about why we should care about program cell death is the nerdy part. And therefore for me it's the most exciting part. Um, do you ever think about what, you know, how life got here or how complicated it is? And an example that I'd like to use is, I mean, look at this beautiful butterfly. <laughs> um, I mean, do you ever wonder, you know, the complex structures of its wings, the colors of it, and, uh, you know, its highly sophisticated brain? Um, <laughs> like, how, how did this get here? And, and I'm, I'm being serious. I am joking, but I'm being serious as well. I mean, how did life get here? And, um, and how can we understand? How can we ever break down something so complex to begin to understand it? And the, the point is that apoptosis, what I'll be talking about tonight, is sort of this uh, circuit. It's, it's a circuit that makes simple decisions, although it doesn't have volition, it doesn't think. But it's capable of integrating signals that go into a cell and executing some outcome. Will the cell live or will it die? And if it makes the outcome, it chooses the outcome of death, 
it will go through a very tight series of events, tightly controlled series of events, to achieve the best outcome for the organism. So that's why I think it's awesome, because it's a very simple yet complex and elegant system. So now that I've given you that introduction, I'll be talking for maybe another 35 minutes, and I want to summarize what we'll talk about before the break. So we're going to talk about this program cell death and where does it happen and when and why. And we need to discuss just a little bit about how cells function normally so that we can finally get to the interesting stuff of how cells die. And um, because it's going to be exhausting for myself and for all of you, I will break how cells die into two phases and we'll take a break in between and get some refreshments and use the restroom and I might run away, you know, if I get too exhausted. And we'll come back and we'll talk about phase two. And finally, we're going to discuss my own work, which is, um, you know, I hope that you'll find it interesting and exciting. But really, I mean, I'm just going to geek out. I'm having a great time, no matter what, and I hope that you guys enjoy it with me. So this is something that is probably review for all of you, but uh, cells, to continue their own existence, they have to divide. So this is true of bacteria, it's true of the cells in, in our own bodies. And um, basically, the cell is able, it has a program in it to make a copy of everything that's in the cell and then split it into two. And this is important for uh, keeping an organism healthy and helping it grow. So this is very prominent, you know, the, the development of a child into an adult. You have a lot of cell division going on there. And just a question for you guys. What kinds of cells will divide rapidly in an adult human? I just pulled up a number of fingers corresponding to the answer that you think is right. So we have skin cells blood cells, liver cells, or all of these. Just hold up fingers. I'll, I'll give you a you know, false answer. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of fours. That's right. So all of these cells are actually very rapidly dividing cells, but I'm just going to talk about one example, which is the liver, just to show how incredibly fast cells can, can divide. So you all probably know that the liver is an important organ for regulating um, the toxin, toxins that are in our blood. It's important for clearing away those nasty things. It also takes care of a lot of the nutrients that we take in. And it's an essential organ for our health. If we didn't have a, a liver, we would not survive very long at all. And so liver failure is also a common problem. And as you probably know, it's possible to take part of the liver from a, a living person with a healthy liver, transplant it into a recipient who has liver failure. And you can even take a very small piece of liver and transplant it. So just as an example, we're going to look at a CT scan, which is a sort of x-ray, complicated x-ray that, that builds a cross-section looking through human tissue. So we're going to look just through the liver, and it's as if we're looking up towards the person's head in these CT scans. And this is the CT scan of a patient who's just received a liver transplant that's equal to about half of a, liver, of a full liver. And you can see here, so the liver is on the left in this case. You can see that they have just a little bit of liver tissue, and then there's these big black areas. And those black areas are basically balloons that are placed in uh, with the liver transplant so that it uh, is stabilized. And this is five days after the transplant that they have gotten in a CT scan. If we then look just two months later, so this is about 60 days later, the liver has completely regenerated. The regenerative capacity, the capacity of these cells to divide and grow, is incredible. We're talking about a mass of probably a couple of pounds worth of liver tissue. So that's really an impressive example of how quickly cells divide. But there are some cells that don't divide very fast. Does anybody want to name one famous cell type that doesn't divide quickly? Yeah, I'm seeing people pointing to their heads. The brain, uh, nerve cells, basically. And they don't divide very often because they form these stable connections. They don't die very often either. And it's important for maintaining memory. And as we know, if you suffer certain types of damage to the brain, it can be very hard to recover because of this. All right, so let's talk about when cells die. And when I say die, I mean by this program of apoptosis. So the first example, which I think is familiar to almost all of you, is uh, in response to some sort of damage. And the example that I'd like to give here is uh, if you're you know, very fair-skinned like myself and you go to Florida, as I did recently, and then you spend too much sun, time in the sun, you're going to get a burn. And you will also develop this peeling. And peeling is actually the apoptosis of the cells on, on your skin. And the, basically those are the dead cells, skin cells peeling away. But I use this term damage here, and I'd like to use the term that we use more as biologists, which is stress. 
And I don't mean the type of stress that graduate students experience before they have a dissertation committee meeting. I mean stress in terms of some sort of chemical or physical insult to the cell. Um, but on the flip side of this, we can also have cells die to prevent cancer or to remove old cells that have accumulated damage slowly over time. So these are two different scenarios that are two sides of the same coin. On, on the one hand, we have very acute stresses, such as sun exposure. And then on the other hand, we have something that's more chronic, where a cell slowly accumulates damage and it executes a program where it basically makes a decision to die. And these are the two examples that I'll be discussing more tonight. There are other situations in which cells will die. We can talk about that more, but one famous example would be in the development of an organism. Sometimes certain tissues will grow out and then disappear. So when, um, as we develop in the womb, we initially have webbing between our fingers, and those cells will actually die away so that we have independent digits. So just to return to this analogy of the house again, what happens when a house gets old and decrepit? First of all, we have to have a city inspector come in, and they might condemn the house, and then there would be a demolition crew comes along, and they're going to take down the entire house, and maybe some engineers or architects would be involved in making sure that the walls of the adjacent houses are not harmed. And that's all before we've even you know, bagged up all the waste or put it into a dumpster and had a cleanup crew come along and get rid of that. And then there's still an empty space where another house could be built. And the point that I'd like to convey to you is that apoptosis is a program that can execute almost all of those things that I told you independently of any outside actor. So the cell will autonomously choose whether or not it's time to die. And then it will go about this process of demolition in a way that doesn't damage the neighboring cells. It will package everything up neatly and basically put it on the curbside and call the cleanup crew to come by and pick up all the waste. And that's what's so amazing about this program of cell death, is that it's a totally cell intrinsic thing that is so important for maintaining the integrity of this tissue. So just I just want to introduce this concept of the cellular circle of life. So we have a, a house or a cell that's old and decrepit and needs to be demolished. It will autonomously demolish itself, but then a neighboring cell will just simply divide and replace it. And, and this is this is, actually, this is actually how it works in the body. It's pretty incredible. But then again, of course, the, these cells, um, if they're, especially if they're rapidly dividing cells, will eventually also need to die again and be replaced by neighboring cells. So this, I mean, basically the whole, all the tissue in our body, with the exception of a few different types of cells, is turning over by this process. So I told you a little, about, uh, a little bit about what this is and when it happens. First of all, it's a program of cell destruction. And the program is the geeky fun part that we're going to talk about for the rest of the night. And uh, this is a normal feature of life for many multicellular organisms, such as ourselves. And this happens all the time, even in healthy people. And if you didn't have apoptosis, then you'd be at more risk of things like cancer. So this is actually a very important process. And it's a clean and organized way for a cell to die. So before I go on to starting to talk about life and death of cells, are there any questions from the audience about what I have talked about so far? You're welcome to ask questions. No judgment here. Yes, there's a question. So as part of this, uh, one cell dies, and then the neighboring cell is going to divide to uh, you know, fill in the space. Is, you know, is there something in the death, you know, death mechanism, the apoptosis mechanism, that's also triggering, you know, enabling the uh, replication? Oh, that's a good question. Actually, you know what? I am so, uh, so the question is whether there's some signal that actually brings in, um, activates a neighboring cell to divide. Um, and I study cell death in such a focused manner that I do not know the answer to that question. I do know that cell death is very good at bringing in the immune system, clear away the debris. And it tends to happen more in tissues that have very rapid turnover of cells. So the cells that are neighboring cells will divide naturally. Um, basically, the short answer is I don't know. I think that there probably is an answer out there. One of the tricky things about studying cell death, and we'll get into some of this later, is that we study a lot of it in uh, a cell culture dish, in a petri dish. And we can't sort of visualize this 3D architecture of cell death happening in tissue. So we don't have good answers for some questions like that, because that's more of a question of how this is working in tissue. 
Another question here. Are they make fat cells die? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a really good question. So the question is, can you make fat cells die? So um, I believe, actually, I, I, I could be wrong about this, but I seem to recall that there was some research that was trying to do this. But the problem is that um, the fat still has to go somewhere. You have to have a way to clear it out of the body as a whole. And if you mobilize a lot of fat away from tissue and into the bloodstream, then it can you know, deposit on arteries and things like that. So the, the cardiac disease and other implications um, of that sort of therapy, although it sounds good in the beginning, um, could be dangerous. And actually, too much death of certain cell types that have a lot of cholesterol in them can also be very dangerous for cardiac health. So, is there any other questions? Yeah. Um, parts of our body that are dead, like hair and nails, yeah. do those go through a totally different process, or is it like halfway through, die with no cleanup? So, it's interesting, the question is about um, parts, tissues that are, that are, you know, sort of Dead and, and but still still functioning as a barrier. Um, I know more about the skin and about hair and, and nails, but I mean certainly the outer layer of skin uh, is is dead. And there are pieces of the program that are active in it. Another famous example of this is platelets. Platelets are little chunks of cells, and they use pieces of the cell death program as they develop into platelets, but not the whole thing. So um, the short answer is that this is overlapping some of those processes that make um, normal uh, defensive barriers or things like hair, but I don't know the specifics of how much it's overlapping, how much it is. That's actually a great question. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, when, um, when the immune system has to kill an infected cell, like yeah. cell, does it activate this, or does it have a separate way of coming in and killing the cell? Yeah. Because it has to do it quickly. So the question is whether the immune system, and I mentioned that the immune system will kill cells, and the question is whether it activates this program, apoptosis that I'm talking about, or has uh, another program. And actually, it turns out that the answer is full. That's actually what our lab studies. So finally, I've got a question that I really know the answer to. Um, <laughs> basically, it, it has uh, certain pieces upstream of this pathway that just feed right into the pathway and get it going really fast. And we'll talk about the pieces that are activated downstream. But then th there are other components when, uh, when an immune cell attacks, it basically attacks another cell and it injects stuff into it. This is how it works. It activates the intrinsic cell death program and then it also attacks other things. And evidence from our lab would show that the other things that are attacked during immune cell mediated death uh, tend to be of pathogens that live inside cells. So it's targeted towards destroying not only the cell that's infected, but the stuff that's inside the cell is causing the infection. So it does both, is the answer. I think I'll move on now, and uh, we'll have plenty of other breaks for questions uh, as we go along. OK, so now we get to talk about how, how cells die. Actually, first, I want to just discuss a little bit about how cells live, because I think to understand uh, the death of a cell, we need to talk about the components that keep cells healthy. And for some of you who have more of a background in biology, I apologize that this will be review, but I promise that I'm getting somewhere. So in this analogy of a cell as a house, uh, you can see that the house has an outer wall. And I use that outer wall to keep uh, it warm inside when it's cold outside, as it often is in Boston, or uh, you know, drier inside when it's raining. And then it also has inner walls that subdivide rooms. And cells have structures very similar to this. We call this outer wall of, of an animal cell, at least we call it the membrane. And also, it has little rooms within it that uh, are bound by membranes. The membrane is made out of lipids, but we won't talk more about that tonight. Um, but these different rooms in the house, they're subdivided to achieve different functions. So let's say that you have a teenage son who listens to a lot of rock music until 1 in the morning. You put him in the bedroom in the basement so everyone else can sleep in the house. And by the, dividing up the house and dividing up functions in the house, it helps us use the house better. Um, the same thing happens in a cell. The cell subdivides compartments within it so that it can perform specific chemistry within these compartments that are not compatible with other compartments in the cell. Uh, and we call these rooms within a cell the organelles. And we're going to talk just a little bit about what these different rooms are, different organelles are in a cell. So I will only discuss our organelles that are important for cell death tonight. So the first, first organelle that is really important that you need to know about is the nucleus. And the nucleus contains the blueprint for the cell. All of the instructions for a cell to 
make a new cell and divide, to repair itself when it encounters some injury, to build something more complex like tissue or an organism, and even the instructions for the apoptosis program. All of those are found in the nucleus in the blueprint of the cell. And I've described it as a blueprint as if the instructions are drawn out in some sort of spatial manner. But really, as I'm sure you know, they're written out in a code, uh, just like letters in the dictionary. And there's just four different letters in the code of DNA, and it occupies what would be the equivalent of about 10 volumes of the Encyclopedia of Britannica. It's a lot of information that's found inside the genome. And another organelle that's extremely important in cell death is something called the mitochondria. The mitochondria are the factories, the energy, basically the power plants of the cell. And the mitochondria are going to play a very key role in the first step, the trigger of cell death, that we're going to talk about in just a minute. But also they're important for the normal functioning of the cell. They give us a lot of ATP, which is the cell's energy currency. And this last area is a space that, uh, that's between the organelles that we call the cytoplasm. And it, when I say a space, actually, it's, you know, it's, it's liquid. And it's like the hallway that connects all of these things. And this hallway and every organelle that I've described so far is full of molecular machines. And these molecular machines are performing the tasks that are the chemistry of life. So just as a house is built up of, of physical pieces, a uh, cell is really built of molecules. And these machines are crucial for playing with molecules in a way that builds up the structures of the cell. So I've shown you this schematic, and I want to just show you that these organelles really do exist. This is a nucleus. It's stained blue DNA. And then all these little red or orangish structures here, those are mitochondria. So we draw them as just a, a little oval in a schematic, but it's actually a tubular network. And then finally, you see this really cool green stain. That's actually, we call that the cytoskeleton, the cell skeleton. And it's really the framework of the cell, just as a house needs a structural framework, a cell does too. So what are the parts that make up um, these organelles? The parts are familiar to you all. The DNA encodes the encyclopedia. It's a very stable molecule that can transmit information from cell um, generation to generation as cells divide. And I want you to imagine this intermediate molecule, mRNA, as a copy that's taken from one page in the encyclopedia that just contains instructions to make one part of the cell. So the DNA has a photocopier of sorts. It's a machine that makes a small copy in a slightly different language. It's almost like a different dialect that then contains instructions to make just one piece of the cell. And that is called a protein. So we say that DNA is transcribed to mRNA and that's translated to protein. And when I say it's translated to protein, what I mean is that the language of RNA and DNA is very different from the language of protein. And to build up a new protein, we need to change the code, convert the code. And the proteins are really the machines of the cell. So let's talk about what proteins are here. They provide structure to all cells. So they are that skeleton that I showed you earlier. And they interact with other proteins to form complex structures. And that's really important, this idea of assembling together complex structures. And they're also the, the catalysts of the chemical reactions of life. So they synthesize new DNA, RNA, and proteins. And they drive the reactions that generate all the raw materials to keep the cell going. And they also are capable of modifying other proteins. So I want you to think of proteins both as a very simple component but also something that can assemble together with a lot of other biological molecules to make something incredibly <laughs> complex that can, that can perform complex and sophisticated tasks. And one type of protein that is really important in cell death that we will talk about is sort of like a pair of molecular scissors. Its job is to snip other proteins in very specific places. So it goes along and it breaks that protein in two by performing a chemical reaction. And I will refer to these proteins as the cast bases. And because biologists are very uh, sophisticated in the artistic realm, we often depict them as Pac-Man. <laughs> so you will see Pac-Man again tonight and remember cast bases. So we've talked about the basics of a living cell. They're enclosed by a lipid membrane. And they have organelles, which are the rooms of the cell, that make up compartments of the cell. DNA is the information molecule of the cell. It's found mostly in the nucleus, and it, it, it is the cell's blueprint, has the cell's blueprint. 
This can be read into something called mRNA, and that's a process called transcription, DNA to mRNA. And then that code of mRNA is translated to a different code to make a new protein. And the proteins are the workhorses of the cell that facilitate all the chemistry of life. So you guys are going to be so bored of this by the end of the talk, but so just to review this analogy again, here we have physical structures built from nails, plaster, wood, brick, cement, and none of those things together look anything like a house. But when we assemble them in the correct way, as we know how to do, and put some paint on it and some shingles on top, well then we have a house. And it's the same thing with cells. We have very simple biological molecules that assemble together in ways that generate new complexity. And this is an important theme for life as we know it. And also, it's important for uh, why I'm interested in cell death, because I want to understand more about complexity. So when we talk about cell death, we're going to dive more into that complexity. Are there any questions about how cells live before we finally talk about cell death? No questions. Oh, one in the back. Okay. It seems to me you've said that there are two powerhouses, one is mitochondria and then the other is protein. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was, uh, it seems that I said there are two powerhouses, one is mitochondria and one's protein, and that is my mistake. When I say uh, powerhouse, I mean that one, one is a structure, the organelle, the mitochondria, that actually is responsible for generating most of the cell's energy supply. And then the other uh, powerhouse, which I think maybe I said workhorse, but I could have said powerhouse, uh, is protein. And proteins are much smaller than organelles, and they, together, Many proteins will uh, interact with other molecules to build up an organelle, complex structures such as an organelle. And in general, proteins are responsible for performing the chemical reactions or for making the chemical reactions possible that are uh, essential for life. Does that make sense? On the one hand, we have a protein that, that basically makes specific sets of reactions possible and also provides structure to, cell, to a cell. And on the other hand, we have an organelle, a much larger structure, that is specifically designed like a power plant to just generate lots of energy from the cell. Any other questions? Okay. So I'm going to dive into the, to the interesting part, how do cells die? And we're going to break the program of apoptosis into two, two phases. The first phase is a switch, and this is a molecular decision-making event. And the second is a phase that we call execution. And we'll talk about phase one before the break and phase two after the break. And the key here is that cell death is genetically encoded. It's a program that is found in the DNA, that's written into our DNA, and it's autonomous to the cell. It's intrinsic to the cell. So cell death can occur in response to stress, as we talked about before. And in the example that I'm giving here, it will occur in response to UV radiation. So here we have a happily living cell on my skin, I go to Florida, I get a lot of sun, UVB radiation, and this actually is going to modify the structure of my own DNA. And the way that it does this, the chemistry of it is actually pretty simple. DNA has different letters that are the bases of DNA, and what it does is it takes two bases that are next to each other, and it makes a new bond between them, a set of new bonds between them. And those new bonds, I told you about proteins, how proteins can read DNA and how they can make uh, RNA from DNA. The proteins can't recognize this new type of DNA with a new bond in it. So the DNA has become damaged. And this is dangerous for the cell because if damage accumulates, yes? Is that two across from each other bonding or two so next to each other on the same? Basically, so we have the two strands of DNA like this. Yeah. See, so the one strands here. And as I understand it, Basically, I have two that are adjacent that are forming a bond. So, um, yeah, and so this is the backbone of the DNA here, and uh, it's just not depicted in the chemical structure. And you have two that are right next to each other that, that form a uh, bond. And this new bond can't be read by the proteins uh, that, that are responsible for copying DNA and making new RNA from DNA. So this is a dangerous situation for the cell. We call it DNA damage. So the cell is capable of recognizing this DNA damage and, and sending out sort of a danger signal, or it has a danger signal to itself. And the, the way that the cell does this is it has specific proteins. In this case, actually it has a lot of proteins that are responsible for finding DNA damage, and then they try to repair it. So you have a whole response that's directed towards sensing a stress, 
trying to do something to repair that stress and the cell can keep going. But at some point, if the cell has just sensed too much stress, it will activate the cell death program. And this is how, how the cell activates cell death is one of the most exciting and interesting areas of research now. So the first step in this program is a very stable switch. We have a cell it's happily living. At some point, it senses stress or it receives a signal. It says it's time to die. And it flips this switch incredibly rapidly to death. So we have a stable state of life that's the default. And then a very stable, of course, stable because it's the terminal state of death. Um, that's the other option. There's, those are the only two options in this switch. So the, the switch is very stable. And when it, it's flipped, it's fast and it's irreversible. And my question for all of you, this is the most perhaps you know, horrible question of my questions for you. Why would this be good for an organism? Why do we want a fast and stable switch? Any thoughts? There's a hand. Um, maybe it's because like um, if you don't die, you're going to get like cancer and stuff. That's a great, so the, the answer that was given is that if, if it doesn't die, you can get cancer. So that's why the, the switch is very fast, right? So once, this, once the cell makes a decision to die, we want to make that irreversible. We don't want it to go back to living again. And as you will see, the whole cell death program damages the cell a lot. So if the cell starts to accumulate some damage because it started to die and then it decides to go back, that can be very dangerous for developing cancer. That's a great answer. Any other thoughts? That does happen sometimes. So the question here is whether that does happen. And basically, for all intents and purposes, it does not. In switch flips, it's irreversible. We can manipulate it in the lab in ways that it kind of can do that. But I want you to think of this switch as being very stable. It doesn't flicker. Imagine a light switch that flickered a lot. That would be annoying. For an organism, that would be dangerous. So um, the other reason that it's fast is, as we were talking about, uh, this is important for removing cells that are infected. And so it could be a fast way to start to attack that infection. And it probably also is fast for um, clearing that out and getting a new cell um, in its place. So it's, it's also important for the integrity of tissue. So that's why the, yep. You mentioned some cells that go partway through this, um, through the switch, and then linger in that state for their, for, for um, mm -hmm. most of their utility. So that's a the the, the question is about um, platelet development, right. and so basically, wherever you can find some creative trick in life, it is used it. So what what life does in that case? I'm going to show you uh, how the switch is activated. They don't have the first step in the switch, but they use some of the downstream pieces to break up some of the structures of the, of the platelet, because platelets are just fragments of bigger cells. So it's a great question. Um, we, when we develop platelets, somehow life has co-opted a piece of this program to, do, to achieve a specific end, but not all of it. So it's just uh, you know the incredible diversity of, of life. Any other questions? Yes? You mentioned <clears throat> that the, uh, you know, the cells attempt to repair the uh, DNA. Is that, you know, Specifically, is that UV damage or is it, you know, linking to uh, bases? Is that repairable or is that one that's not yeah. repairable? So actually, that is a type that's repairable. And actually, um, cell has an incredible diversity of mechanisms to repair DNA. And some of them are really good, high fidelity mechanisms that make the DNA as it was before. And some of them are not very good. And that's a whole other amazing program that I don't know as much about. Um, but basically, there are many different molecular machines that do that work. And uh, they repair a lot of different types of outbreaks. It's a short answer. All right, I'm going to move on because I want you guys to be able to take a break. Um, so the mitochondria are the organelle that are the, the energy uh, producing power plants of the cell. And they're controlling the first step. And basically, the key point here is that mitochondria have two membranes. They have an outer membrane and this inner membrane here. And this is important for their function in generating energy for the cell. But there's one special protein that resides between the two membranes. It, it's, that's where it spends its time in the living cell, and it's called cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is a very small protein, and it usually has a function in making energy for the cell. But the proteins that are responsive to stress, they actually will um, work together to make holes in the membrane, uh, of the outer membrane of the mitochondria. And this release of cytochrome C into the cytoplasm is a trigger. So the first step in phase one is, is a trigger. And it's very simple. We have 
the cytoplasm here, the inside of the mitochondria here, and holes are formed in the mitochondria that are just big enough for cytochrome C to escape. And it does. And when it enters the, cyto the cytoplasm, this is the initiation of the next step in the cell death program. So I want to show you real data wherever I can. And this is images of this happening. Here we have cells that are grown in a petri dish, looking at them in a microscope. And the cytochrome C is labeled with uh, basically a red fluorescent tag, and DNA is in blue. And you can see it sort of has this um, patchwork tubular pattern in living cells. <laughs> And then they're treated with a drug. And you see this pattern becomes very diffuse. This is the trigger. This is the first step in the cell death program, going from this pattern that's found just in the mitochondria into the cytoplasm as a whole. And later on, the cells can actually break up. So the next step is a molecular scaffold that introduces a lot of the principles of, of how life functions. We have one protein that has a very specific notch in it. And that notch very nicely fits cytochrome C. And we call this a lock and key model. Basically, we have the lock, which is this notch in this protein. And the key, the only key, is cytochrome C. And once cytochrome C binds this lock, it makes the shape of the protein change. And it makes it change in a man manner that it can start to aggregate with itself. And as the protein aggregates with itself, it generates this new face here. See this, this basically the circular surface that I've drawn? Now it's a new circular face. And this process of the molecule aggregating together is self-assembly, is what we call it. And again, here we have simple parts building together to perform some complex task. And you can see this space here actually fits very nicely with the first Pac-Man that we're going to talk about tonight, caspase 9. Caspase 9 is one of these cell death proteins that cuts other proteins. And just like the lock and key again, caspase 9 fits right onto this new face of the scaffold. And that face doesn't exist in living cells because the scaffold cannot self-assemble. This is another great way that the switch is regulated. You see you need lots of cytochrome C to get this whole thing to aggregate together. So you can't just have a little bit of cytochrome C leak out and initiate cell death. You need enough to really get this program performed. Okay, so we have the scaffold. And I just want to discuss briefly the person who did this work. His name is Xiaong Wang, and he's a biochemist at University of Texas, um, and he does he did some incredible work to discover this protein and how it works. And this is a, a reconstruction of what we believe the protein looks uh, like based on uh, electron microscopy images of thousands of these protein complexes. And this is the face of caspase 9 binding onto this propeller-shaped scaffold. Cytochrome C binds right here in each of these little subunits of the scaffold. You can see that it has seven different subunits that aggregate together for the binding of caspase 9. So this is an incredible example of self-assembly of uh, these proteins together. We call this the apoptosome. So finally, this initiates a cascade. Caspase 9 is here, and it's active now. Before it was inactive, and it was floating free. Now it's bound to the scaffold. And binding to the scaffold makes it active. And it will cut one other protein, it cuts uh, several proteins, but the most important protein that it cuts is actually another caspase. And upon cutting this caspase, it makes it active. And this caspase is everyone's favorite caspase because it's the executioner caspase. <laughs> and the executioner caspase, the, uh, the other key feature before we take a break that I want you to remember is that this caspase can, can go and cut more uncut copies of caspase 3. There's a lot of caspase 3 in the cell. There's not much caspase 9, but there is a lot of caspase 3. So what happens is we have caspase 9 cut caspase 3. Caspase 3 can go and cut more caspase 3. And you see we have very rapid amplification of the signal. So in terms of the structure of this switch, I told you that it, it happens very fast. This is so key for making this switch very fast. You have very rapid exponential amplification of the signal. So we have a molecular trigger, which is the release of cytochrome C. There's a scaffold, a molecular scaffold that assembles. And a, a signal cascade, which has this nice amplifying feature to it, initiates. And we call this the caspase cascade. And now I'm going to show you one experiment. This experiment is a really neat experiment. We have uh, a microscope with fluorescence capability. 
And actually, it's a sophisticated microscope that has a chamber on it, and we can keep cells alive in this chamber. It takes cells that are grown in a petri dish, and being able to grow cells outside of the human body, human cells, such as cancer cells, I'm sure you've heard of HeLa cells, this is a huge advancement for studying things like cell death. So we can take cells that are growing outside the body in a petri dish. And the last thing we need to study this switch is some way to look at the activity of caspase 3. And what was done to do this is they basically engineered a nice system that gives you fluorescence that's proportional to the amount of caspase 3 activity. And it's an interesting system. We can talk about it in the break if anybody's curious. But just remember that fluorescence is directly proportional to caspase 3 activity. And I told you before that the switch is stable, it's fast, and it's irreversible. And now I can finally show you data. So here we have cells that are growing under a microscope, they're kept alive in an environment. They have this, this fluorescent out readout of caspase 3 activity. And they're just put under the microscope stage, and at time zero, There's going to be a line here, and each line is the trace of the fluorescence of an individual cell. And what happens is we go through a decision phase, there's a lag after the drug is added, time zero, and the cells are basically deciding whether to die or not. And then each of these traces is the activity of caspase 3 of an individual cell. And you can see they very quickly go from no activity to the maximum activity. This, in a very short time, a period of minutes, and then they never go back down. This is, this is the structure of the switch. It's very fast, on, goes up to the full activity, and there's no reversion down to low activity. And this data, I and mean, this was an incredibly, incredible experiment when it was first done, and this shows how robust this cell life program is. All right, you've earned a break. Are there any questions before the break? Oh. Yeah. Uh, so, all the things, proteins, and aspects, all that stuff is Yes. So the question is, all these things are in a cell at any given time? And um, the answer is basically yes, although different types of cells in the body have very different levels of these proteins. So um, some cells are very resistant to the mitochondrial step, the release of cytochrome C. And those cells are resistant to the mitochondrial step because the proteins that, that regulate the formation of pores in the membrane holes that release cytochrome C, those can be very high. Some of those proteins have very high expression and they inhibit the formation of holes. And those proteins that inhibit formation of holes in the membrane, a lot of them are cancer genes because they prevent activation of cell death. But they have normal functions in cells as well. So all these proteins are important for normal cell function. Other questions? There's a question here. Okay, so you know, the idea is that it's quick and clean. And yeah. uh, like within that minutes, you know, things break down so much that you know that there's no time for anything damaging to be by Right. I guess the question is, uh, is there even <clears throat> any outside chance during that time that uh, particular cell that can produce some things that you know, you know that can cause further damage down the line? Of okay. So the question is, this is all happening very fast, but is there a chance that this can be damaging? And the answer is basically yes. Um, even though I've described this as happening fast, I haven't talked about what happens after the switch has been flipped and what we call the execution phase. phase. And that's the destruction of the cell and that takes a little bit longer. So that's, that's one thing. Um, but then the other thing is that if you have too much of this happening, it can be dangerous to an organism. So one example that came up in our discussions of this is radiation poisoning. Um, blood cells are very sensitive to high doses of radiation and they die by this cell death program. So uh, if you were more resistant to cell death in your blood cells, you might be able to survive a higher dose of radiation. But on the flip side, you'd be at higher risk for certain cancers. Um, so it can be damaging, and some of the contents of the cell can be damaging. Um, if you have too much cell death in one place, the immune system still can't handle it. So are there other questions? Yep, up here. Uh, question, what limits the implementation so that I noticed in your curve, it, it sort of like went up and then it didn't overshoot the module oscillate. Right. So it reached the threshold and stabilized, which suggests some sort of mechanism that there's, right. a, there's a, a limiting factor as it accelerates up to that threshold. 
It's a great question. So the question is about basically the plateau that we see. And I think that there are two possible answers for this experiment. One is that the experiment, that the, the range of the experiment can't read all the way to, to the maximum. So that the assay itself actually saturates. But the other possible explanation is there's only so much caspase 3 in the cell. And we're reading the activity of caspase 3. It's possible that that itself um, has all been activated and we're at full activity. So either the assay can read all the way up to the top or the, the experiment itself saturates. And um, either one of those is possible and I don't know that we really know the answer to that question. Are there other, there's another question here. Does the scaffolding protein have any other use in the cell when it's not activated by cytochrome? Oh, that's a great question. So the, the question was about the scaffolding protein and does it have any other function in the cell? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that we do know that a lot of these proteins have function, normal functions in cells, like cytochrome C is extremely important for the life of a cell. But I don't know about the scaffolding protein. Um, it's a good question. Yes? How come caspase 3 doesn't kill cancer cells? So the question is, why doesn't caspase 3 kill cancer cells? And the answer is that it, it does um, if the cells have an intact cell death program. So one extremely active area of cancer research is to try to get this program working in cancer. Um, sometimes this pathway is so heavily mutated that you can't target it in cancer. So it, it can be a problem. Yeah, one more question, then we'll take a break. And I can take questions down here. So the process starts in the mitochondria, and the mitochondria used to be independent bacteria or whatever. Yeah. They have their own DNA and everything. Is this encoded for in that DNA or in the nuclear DNA, or is that actually coevolution between the two? It just seems amazing that it starts in something that used to be an independent organism. So the, the question refers to this um, idea, which is not just a theory, I think it's pretty well proven, that's called the endosymbiont hypothesis, which is that the mitochondria, unlike other organelles, are actually a bacteria that started living cooperatively with uh, basically a complex animal predecessor cell. Early in evolution, we had bacteria come and actually live inside other cells. And they started to, as a byproduct of living inside those cells, generate energy for the cell, probably in exchange for something that the cell gave to the endosymbiont, the thing that lived inside of it. And now mitochondria are a very stripped down version of that bacteria. So they, the, the DNA that's in mitochondria, they have a little bit of DNA, and it only has um, the instructions to make a few proteins. And so the short answer to your question is that um, most of the proteins that are in this program are not uh, in the code of the mitochondria. And so I think that this is something that actually came from uh, the DNA of the nucleus, from the, the instructions from the animal cells nucleus, and it evolved later on after all of that happened. That's the, that's the belief. So we don't, I don't think we really know, you know what the role is of bacteria living inside cells and how that interplays with this program. Probably that came first would be my answer. Okay. Let's take a break and come back in 10 minutes and we'll finish up talking about my research. <laughs> I don't think there's a video. It's possible there's not even an audio feed, honestly. I can't. We did see. There's an audio feed. Okay. So people get to listen to this process. They can listen to it, but they can't <laughs> see it. Because <laughs> um, if they were. We want, oh, well, I guess I should do it that way. Oh, it's this one. No, no, it's a different window. Oh, sorry. Put that back in. Okay, I don't use a Mac either. Uh, so, if it were working, we'd probably want to do it like hey. that. So, the audio is working. You can hear it playing, but there's oh, no okay. image. Interesting. We tried to do a capture just to see if it, but I have yeah, no idea. Yeah, we didn't see anything. Okay, let's see. So let's try ending the